Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Luke Vibranchik. Uh, and today, as you can see, I have a very special guest uh, at my channel. It's Jordan from the Reason to Doubt channel. Hello there. Thanks for having me on. Today, I would like to uh, talk a little bit about the Shroud of Turin. I found you to be an invaluable resource uh, for all things Shroud related. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I found your playlist uh, online where you and Jared from the Reason to Doubt uh, channel go through all sorts of uh, material regarding the studies around the Shroud of Turin and so on. But there's more to your channel, so I wanted to uh, uh, first uh, ask you to say a few words about yourself and about the channel that you have. Sure. Uh, well, I'm Jordan. I am a nuclear engineer, and I run the Reason to Doubt YouTube channel with my friend Jared. He's a former theologian. We're both atheists, but primarily we're skeptics. And so the channel is about skepticism. We basically just scrutinize claims and kind of try to walk through the way you debunk pseudoscience and uh, claims like that. It's religion plays a prominent part just because we're both atheists, we're interested in it, but it's not mm. just that. Uh, we think that skepticism is not just the purview of atheists. Anybody can be a skeptic. You just have to have good reasons for what you believe. And I think everyone should do that. I think so too. <laughs> and <laughs> just as an uh, introduction, I'm pretty sure that everybody knows uh, uh, m what the Shroud of Turin is. It's hard to like dodge all of those uh, pseudoscience articles and... and uh, like popularistic or, or like propagandistic almost um, uh, articles about uh, a new discovery uh, that comes uh, comes out like uh, every five years or so the the subject seems to resurface uh, it seems yeah. to be doing that now with the x-ray study that Cameron Bertuzzi from the the capturing yeah. Christianity popularized uh, I've seen it picked up by what what do you mean? Uh, and now secular uh, channels are joining the discussion. And I think you're the leader as far as the Shroud of Turin goes. <laughs> so, so I decided to uh, contact you so we can discuss this in depth. But to start, I'd like to just ask you to say a few words about what the Shroud of Turin is and just give me some, some basic features to which the pro-authenticity and, and the against authenticity, I guess, medievalist, uh, mm, 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 the crowd uh, appeals to when they talk about the Shroud of Turin? Sure. So the Shroud of Turin is a single piece of linen. It's a long cloth. It's like four, 4.3 meters by 1.1 meters. And the main feature of it is that on one side of the cloth, you've got this faint brownish image of a person. He's a naked man. Uh, it's got his front and back. So it's kind of like if a person was laid on the cloth and it was draped over their head. Um, it's a little easier to see what's going on in negative, which they make a lot of hay out of. But basically, it's an image of a person who's been beaten up. He's got blood all over him. He's bearded and stuff. And so everyone believes that this is intended to be Jesus of Nazareth, whether or not it actually is. And the main claim from the people who think it's authentic is that this is... This image was left miraculously as a result of the resurrection. And so therefore... The image being there is a divine miracle. It's evidence of a miracle. And so we should believe or you know, for all whatever conclusions you want from that. Um, the main features that they point to for that are that the image, nobody knows how it was made. Um, there are a lot of ideas, but mm. it's got some interesting properties. It's a negative image. Uh, so where the body would be closer to the cloth, it's darker. Um, and so, of course, when you reverse it, it looks the other way. Uh, it's very, very thinly applied, extremely thinly applied, but there's no obvious signs of like a paint, like um, right. which the SERP team determined. And so it's very mysterious how it was made whenever it was made. But as to when it was made, they decided to test it. And it turned out, at least the testing did not indicate it was first century. And then, you know, so that's how we got here. I've seen a few debates um, in which uh, your opponent uh, just... I mean, they try to push this narrative that it somehow doesn't matter uh, uh, what's the dating of that object. Uh, they some uh, one guy, the Dale from uh, what was the Real name? Seekers. Of this? Real Seekers. Real Seekers. He has this argument that uh, he alleges is our argument. Uh, I, I've never heard the skeptic utter that argument, but it's our argument somehow. Mm, and one of the premises is, is that it's irrelevant mm, as to uh, uh, when exactly. What's the origin or, or, or origin date, I should say? Mm, uh, and what's the actual age 
of, of that linen. Yeah, Dale. I like Dale a lot. He's. I think he's a great example of a religious skeptic. I disagree with almost everything he says, but I think he has. You know, he tries hard to examine the evidence. But his argument there. What he's trying to say is that the Shroud of Turin is miraculous, regardless of when it was made. And hmm. so if it, he thinks it was first century, but even if it was in fact a medieval artifact, it's a medieval artifact that was a divine created thing for whatever reason. Hmm. And hmm. so because it's a miracle, it should uh, lead to spiritual belief, right. even if it never touched Jesus. Right, now, right. I guess as far as it goes, sure, if, if it was in fact a miracle, I yeah. mean, it's a miracle, right? But um, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know. It seems kind of strange to me that yeah. God, 14 centuries after Jesus says, like, you know what would be the best us. thing? To, you, you know <laughs> the best thing to do right now? I'm going to take this cloth and just like just thinly paint a little brown <laughs> image on it. That'll do it. You know, <laughs> I don't know. But. Right. And also, <laughs> as you as you yourself have uh, have pointed out, would people really be so worked up about it? If it really was like if it was a miracle from the 15th century, uh, it seems that yeah. the claim to fame of the shroud is that it is actually Jesus's shroud. Yeah, it for is sure. from that spot and that time. And to be clear, I would prefer that that was the case. It would be st neat. It would be really cool to yeah. have a Jesus actual shroud. That'd be awesome. Mm. But I don't think we do. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And some atheists have attempted to explain um, Christianity away, in a way. I mean, what I have in mind is that um, the proposition is that uh, Christianity was born, or the, the belief in the resurrection was born because of the fact that the apostles saw uh, the, the, the Shroud of Turin and, and concluded, yeah, th he must have rose or something. I'm not sure what's the, the logical connection there or, or how it's, the argument is supposed to go. But yeah, I don't buy it either. <laughs> no. This leads me to my second question. So, in my view, uh, or from what I understand, uh, the most serious and, and the, the 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 investigation and the study which give us gives us the clearest picture of what the shroud is is the radiocarbon dating. And you have spent a lot of time um, talking about that. Uh, on your channel, and I'd like to uh, ask you about that. So, uh, what was the radiocarbon dating done in 1988? Uh, how did they go about uh, doing it? What's uh, which which part did they select? And if there's a reason why, then uh, uh, do you know what it is? Mm, I'd like to uh, just ask you to to say a few words about the radiocarbon dating. Sure, I agree. I think the radiocarbon dating is the single most important aspect of the investigation of the Shroud of Turin, uh, because when it was done, it dated to uh, the Middle Ages, which of course is very different from what everyone was expecting. And I think if we didn't have this carbon dating, it would be kind of like a, I don't think it would be getting as much controversial play as it did. But in any case, in 1988, like you said, a team of researchers uh, prevailed upon the church to um, do another round of testing. We, they finally were able to get access to the cloth. Now. There was all kinds of arguments surrounding the carbon dating, what kind of testing scheme they would do, all these sort of things. And I'm not going to go into all that drama. But ultimately, what they decided to do was to use the method that was new at the time, which is the AMS, the uh, mass spectroscopy method. And that is as opposed to the counting method. So before that, they would take big chunks of their sample, and they would basically count how often the carbon-14 in it decayed. Uh, spitting out electrons. Uh, the new method, new then, now it's very well established, mm -hmm. but new then was they could measure the ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12. Mm -hmm. So in the universe or in the atmosphere, most carbon is carbon-12. It has 12 nucleons, uh, but occasionally you get some extra neutrons in there, has two extra neutrons, carbon-14 does, and that makes it unstable to decays. So uh, AMS can measure that ratio directly, and it the the payoff is it requires way less sample to be destroyed mm -hmm. to do the measurement, which is why they were able to get it to be on the shroud because for obvious reasons, they didn't want to cut up big chunks of this holy relic. You know, There were three labs that were selected, the University of Arizona, the University of Oxford, and the Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich. They're commonly referred to as Oxford, Zurich, and Arizona when people are talking about it. Um, and so they did their thing. They published their results. Uh, the sampling they did was only from one 
part one the very bottom corner of the cloth and that was a di- that differed from the method they wanted to do what they wanted mm-hmm. to do was take samples from all over the cloth right uh, which would be better obviously because yeah. if there's something wrong you make a mistake or you know somebody spills their lunch on the corner or whatever anything goes wrong <laughs> if it if it's scattered around it's less likely to go wrong uh, right. but that was rejected uh, and they ultimately chose to do j- samples from just one spot. I think primarily because that spot had previously been cut away. There was a sample mm-hmm. taken years before from that same spot. So they figured, well, we're already cut there. Let's cut again. Yeah. I believe Arizona got uh, two samples. One was above uh, the, the remaining ones, right? Mm-hmm. Oxford and, and Zurich got those in the middle. And Arizona was at the very bottom and a strip at the top. Am I getting this right? Yeah. So the way it worked was um, they cut out a column and then they kind of parceled it out to the labs. And they tried to make it even. But um, so when Arizona, mm-hmm. Zurich and Oxford... Uh, but they realized that Arizona's, the first piece they got was a little bit lighter, didn't have quite as much mass as the other two, so they gave it a tiny sliver from the bottom. Mm, So they'd mm. all be about equal. Uh, Interestingly, Arizona only tested that top strip, Mm -hmm. and that wasn't reported originally. That didn't Mm. come out until many years later when people were trying to investigate. uh, uh, Riani et al. did some, like, fancy modeling to determine and they're like hey these results only make sense if you didn't test that second strip and then they asked arizona they're like yeah we've got it right here so that Mm -hmm. second strip still exists the university of arizona has it so presumably they could do more testing with it if they chose to yeah actually i'm going to come back to that i didn't realize that i'm going to come back to that when we talk about bob rucker's uh, theory uh Mm -hmm. but the final study after they analyzed their data, they published it in Nature, I believe. Mm-hmm. Correct. 1989. The dating was done in 88, but the paper was published in 89. Mm. So a high-quality prestige journal. It's not like... Um, I, I, rec- recently, I've uh, uh, Rebecca Watson, one of the skeptics, uh, the, the OGs from the uh, uh, Skeptics Guide to the Universe uh, podcast, recently made a video about the Shroud of Turin, and she said that uh, for example, the the X-ray dating that uh, everybody is ge- getting so worked up about recently, mm, like the journal in which that was published has an impact factor of one, and uh, Nature has an impact factor of fifty, <laughs> I believe. Yeah. So, uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> Heritage, which is the paper the wax is dating was published in, is certainly nowhere near the class of Nature. <laughs> Nature is like one of the most prestigious journals there there is. Right. Right. And also, just to, to, um, let's let's uh, forget about the prestige, radiocarbon dating as a method of, of just um, establishing an age of archaeological finds, but also like I believe like trees or, or all sorts of objects which used to live, mm-hmm. used yeah. to be alive, has been well established and has been studied for like uh, when was it that it was devised? Like I, uh, we're getting close. Uh, I mean. At least 70 years of continuous research, right? The better part of a century. It's an extremely well-established dating method based on fundamental laws of physics that can't change. Now, that is not to say that the dating method is without flaws or limitations. Every dating method is going to have limitations. For example, with uh, carbon dating, Mm -hmm. it assumes that you're getting your primarily the radiocarbon in your body is coming. Its ultimate source is the atmosphere. So you have about as much in you as the atmosphere had, right? Mm, mm-hmm, mm. But that is not true for all creatures. There are some creatures that live in shallow water, and it doesn't work for them. And so you right. just can't use it for them. But linen is not a shallow water marine creature. So linen works fine. Uh, right. But you have to clean it, you have to prepare it, you have to be careful with uh, contamination. So, you know, but in principle, it's an extremely well vetted method that's been used No telling how many times, thousands, if not Mm, millions of times. mm, Right, right. So now let's let's uh, turn our attention to the criticism. Uh, uh, It seems to me, uh, at least when I look at the history of the discussion over the shroud, for example, Joe Nickel wrote uh, his book before the carbon dating. He maintained that that there were perfectly like perfectly well uh, established pieces of evidence that when taken together, established that that the Shroud isn't authentic and that we should all just reject the pro-authenticity claim, even before it was carbon dated. Mm -hmm. And 
when I look at the history of, of the debate, it seems to me that the arguments of the sort of, well, there's a patch in there, we, uh, because that's the one of the main arguments. In fact, I mean, Joe Marino has just taken over, um, uh, if some of you might not know it, but Barry Schwartz, uh, a, a serious and uh, uh, and like engaged person a, pho a photograph a photographer i should say who uh, photographed the the shroud back in the stirp times mm, and who was i, I mean uh, the guy seems extremely sincere uh, and the fact that he he you know founded this shroud.com site is extremely helpful and uh, the fact that mm, it listed all of those studies and allowed you to, to download them for free that's something mm -hmm. like we should really thank him for. Uh, and now the shroud is in the hands of Joe Marino. Joe's theory about, uh, or, or his method on, on like dismissing the evidence from the carbon dating was to say that uh, there's a patch in there or an invisible weave, or invisible <laughs> mending was done in that part of the shroud. It seems to me that all of those claims uh, just come, uh, have started to appear after the, the dating, am I getting this right? Well, I, I think there were just the, the most of them did come after the dating because uh, not all of them. There were some discussions before, but mm -hmm. primarily it came after the dating because the, the dating was a problem that needed to be explained away, right? Right, right. And so I should explain why this entire controversy happened for anyone who isn't aware. So they published the results in Nature. They got dates of 1260 to 1390 CE and with a 95% confidence interval. Uh, but as people looked into the dates later, looked into their data and uh, eventually got the raw data, though it was very difficult for them to pry that data out from the people who had it, uh, they found that there was some inconsistencies with the data. So... Mm -hmm. Uh, Arizona and Zurich's results overlapped significantly. They uh, almost completely overlapped. But Oxford's, the one that was the furthest to the bottom that was tested, is a little bit older than the other two. Uh, it doesn't quite overlap with Zurich. Mm -hmm. And when you analyze this, the results are heterogeneous as opposed to homogeneous. And what mm. that means is that while you're you're going to have some variance between labs, um, there's the samples are never going to be 100% identical. So you expect right. the labs to come up with a little bit of difference. Uh, a heterogeneous sample set means that there is something real, some actual effect in the underlying test that right. it that there is a difference there. That difference could be a whole host of things. It could be that Anything from they were actually testing two different claws and one wasn't the shroud of turn at all to one was contaminated more than the others or, you know, there's there, there all kinds of things that could lead to heterogeneous results. So the question is, how do we explain these results? Now, the the hypotheses that you mentioned, visible reweave is one, radiation is another. Uh, they are proposed by people who often... Uh, they, they want you to think that this is like a massive gulf. There's like this huge flaw. We should just throw the radiocarbon dating out. We shouldn't look at it all. It's complete nonsense. You know, we should just reject it entirely. The thing is, they don't reject it entirely. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's funny because they'll say, oh, we should not look at it at all. It, it's complete nonsense. You can't trust it at all. Yeah. And then with the next breath, they will tell you why how to explain the data that they have. Well, mm. if we can just throw it away, we don't need an explanation. Right, right. Right. I think this really needs to be highlighted. Uh, maybe I didn't express it clearly enough. So the result of the radiocarbon dating was that it's absolutely not Jesus' shroud. It's right, because Jesus century. did not exist. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a thousand and two hundred years later, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it, I think it ne needs to be stressed these were three independent labs. They worked on their own, and then right. uh, the, the, the results were summarized. And these are high class, some of our best labs to, to do that type of work, right? It, they, well, they were selected because they were the ones that were best equipped to do the most modern methods, right? right. Uh, because they were the ones that had the equipment to do this brand new method. Again, brand new at the time not brand new now. Um, but yeah, they are, they're well-established labs. They, I, I believe they all still operate today. But I don't want to downplay the fact that there are flaws in the dating, that right. there were mm -hmm. problems, that the sampling site, the fact that they only sampled from one site, 
that's not great. It would be much better had they sampled from everywhere. Uh, yeah. It wasn't a truly blind test mm -hmm. because they, they did give them controls. Right to test and they they didn't tell them what which one was which but the shroud is a very distinctive weaving pattern and so anyone who cared to know which one they were testing could know uh mm -hmm. the, the labs were not supposed to endeavor to figure out what they were testing but they could have you know so right. it, it wasn't a truly blind test so there, there were potential issues with it but in order for it to be like some vast conspiracy you'd have to expect that arizona and zurich and uh, Oxford all got together and like, oh man, the, our results say first century, and for some reason we can't hate Christianity, <laughs> yeah, and yeah, we want to yeah. prove that Jesus was a, a fraud. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know what their incentive would have been because I'm sure that everyone would have been uh, just as happy if it had been first yeah, century. Of but course. I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. In fact, like I find it hard to imagine the atheist who would like to like force his opinion on the data like even assume that all of those lab workers were atheists which they weren't but yeah of course <laughs> <laughs> what would be the motivation to f falsify that data i mean it's, i find it quite incredible when when that is suggested and it is suggested i mean you know how those godless atheists are you can't trust <laughs> right. they have no basis for their morality <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah and just getting back to, to a point you made, mm. pro-authenticity uh, guys, syndenologists, shroudies, uh, however you would like to call them, uh, they, they offer these um, sort of theories which are meant to explain why the date is so late. And mm. it's like the invisible reweave or the, you know, Bob Rucker's theory. And... Uh, as a separate endeavor, they try to just tell us that we shouldn't, we should discount the data from the uh, uh, radiocarbon dating look like altogether. They should pick a lane, pick one. It's either one or the other. Yeah, I think that um, you can't rely on the radiocarbon dating to tell you exactly what decade or century it mm -hmm. came from. So because it is flawed, right? right. And so is it from 1260? or 1300 or 1390 or maybe somewhere to the right or left of that a little bit mm. i can't say but that's not the question anyone is asking it's almost a bit of a bait and switch they'll say oh well it's not you know within this 95 percent confidence interval first of all there's more than just 95 percent is not the only confidence interval you could have a lower confidence with a wider anyway mm. uh that aside um nobody is asking is this definitively 14th or 13th century the only question we want to answer is is it first century right or not mm -hmm. Yes yeah. or no? That's all we need to answer. And for that, well, that's a completely different question, right? Yeah. Because, all, and I think that's why they have to go through this effort to um, come up with alternate hypotheses because this radiocarbon did not come from nowhere. Mm -hmm. They didn't mm -hmm. just make it up. They measured carbon uh, ratio exactly. of carbon-14 and carbon-12 that indicated a medieval age. That is a fact that you can't just ignore. Yeah. Um, and that's why they've exactly. a lot of ink has been spilled in order to find alternative expl explanations. And before we dive deep into those explanations, I also wanted to uh, ask you about these, like the, the heterogeneity, the lack of uniformity. So, really, it's only Oxford that stands uh, away. I mean, is slightly misaligned from the two for the remaining two. Mm -hmm. Am I getting this right? That's correct. Uh, that if Oxford hadn't tested at all then the results from um, Zurich and Arizona would be homogeneous. They would be fine and there'd be no problems. Um, mm, mm. And Oxford's is very slightly off. And I, I keep emphasizing this because, again, you get this narrative that is mm. this massive mm -hmm. that just say it's heterogeneous, heterogeneous, heterogeneous. And it is. But if you look at um, some of the papers on uh, the contamination, for example, that hypothesis it talks about, um, Oxford's if Oxford's results had been just 10 years closer to the other two, mm. it would have been homogeneous. Now, right, right. it wasn't, so it isn't. I don't want right. to, it's not, mm -hmm. I, again, I don't want to yeah. pretend like it's not, but this isn't like Oxford's was like way, like 500 years wrong yeah. or anything like this. You know, it's a very, very small difference that, that they're hanging their hat on. Um, right, right. But. Yeah, I think so too. And also, I just wanted to like uh, ask you about one talking point that 
Bob Rucker keeps getting back to. So he has this, this sentence that he keeps uttering, which goes like, uh, there are now four studies, four peer-reviewed studies, uh, which show that the statistics have been mishandled. I checked the four studies that he has in mind. Uh, like, two of those are the Walsh and Schwalb, or Walsh and mm -hmm. Schwalbe uh, papers. And I, I've checked if you, in your videos, uh, quote those papers, and you do, actually. So maybe you have a slightly different take than Bob does. <laughs> uh, so he's probably talking... I. I I tried to figure out which papers he was talking about one time. Mm -hmm. uh, Walsh and Schwab, Riani, who published two different papers. Um, right. I'm not sure what his fourth one is. Mm. But ultimately, I don't necessarily agree with Rucker's characterization of it. That they incorrectly handled the data. The data was not handled correctly. Because mm. these three results, if you uh, properly handle the data, they're heterogeneous. So you can't just mash them together. That is true. And mm. so there are there are peer-reviewed papers that indicate that. So mm -hmm. if you strip away the pejoratives and the judgment and like the, right. the insinuations of this vast conspiracy, then mm -hmm. the, the bald fact is that the data, had it been treated properly at the time, would not have been reported as homogeneous data. Right. That is a fact, right? Now, it, I don't think we need to draw any other conclusions from that fact other than that it was, in fact, heterogeneous <laughs> data. Right, right, yeah. Yeah, he sometimes, like, uh, uh, another of his talking points is, like, the definition of heterogeneous. That this sometimes, somehow means that we should just throw it out. Yeah. That I find to be complete madness. Yeah, Bob, uh, he, did, he does exactly what... Um, so Bob Rucker, and we'll talk more about him in his thing, <laughs> but just so people know, Bob Rucker is another nuclear engineer, mm. uh, who I don't think likes me very much, and uh, because I'm a nuclear <laughs> engineer, disagrees with him, and I guess that bothers him. But in any case, um, he has said in very strong terms that because it's heterogeneous, you don't know what led to that heterogeneity, and therefore the effect could be anything of any magnitude, right? <laughs> anything at all, there's no way to know, uh, and so you have to throw it out completely, which, no, that's, I mean, it is true that you don't know how big the effect is, right? Mm, but mm. like Oxford's only this far away, you know? Right, right. And so like his statement is not necessarily false, but like I said, he doesn't throw the data away. Uh, right, when we right. had that, we had, I had a discussion on the, the uh, Real Seekers podcast with um, Joe Marino and Bob Rucker and several other um, fine people who study this for a living or hobby. They, they, this is their Almost life. Living. And so In any case, yeah, they yeah. keep talking about it and they're everywhere <laughs> right. about it. Yeah. I, I think some of them retired. doesn't matter. Anyways, <laughs> uh, so I talked to them about this and this came up. And after Bob had made that point, well, we should throw it away. I was like, well, Bob, your hypothesis depends on the data being exactly as it is on them actually measuring the carbon-14. Yeah. And that was a real measurement. Do you think it's a real measurement? And he said, yes. And I was like, okay, then. then. Like, what are, we, yeah. what are we talking what? about? Like, all like <laughs> that's the thing. Why the even pushback? The I mean. Even the people who say we should throw it out then do not throw it out. The mere fact that they will spend hours, days, weeks, months of their lives trying to explain away the data shows that they don't believe that we should throw it out either. And so, <laughs> yeah, yeah, some cognitive dissonance there. I guess. Um, now let's dive into the theories, the hypotheses that are meant to uh, explain. Uh, that inf that piece of information, piece of evidence, uh, but in light of a th of a like grand theory, which just postulates that w w eventually we'll find out that it is first century, or at least that the thesis of its uh, first century origin still can hold hold its right. ground. Let's take the invisible mending uh, because Joe Marino is now the the the. the uh, the owner of Shroud.com. Uh, I guess that makes him decent the knowledgeist. Mm, yeah. <laughs> he wrote like a huge uh, book about this. Uh, he and his late wife, Sue Benford, yeah, came up with the invisible mending hypothesis. It's supposed to be motivated uh, by the fact that they sent pictures of that, that little segment uh, to a bunch of like... Uh, weavers or people who specialize in all sorts of fabrics and they were hesitant about it 
but said that maybe this is this has been mended. Uh, mm. And I think there are various perspectives from which this theory can be assessed. And you've actually approached it from a, a few different angles. Um, one being like uh, uh, whether this is a realistic postulate, whether we would be able to like. Mm, mm, see it with the naked eye with our naked eye or whether the the dating would be as it is uh if only it was mended in the 15th century let's say mm, because right. they have to postulate some sort of theory about when that exactly was done the french reweave so maybe if you could please say a few words about about that and what you think uh, about the invisible mending hypothesis Right, so uh, the invisible reweave hypothesis goes that the <clears throat> area of the shroud that was tested was damaged at some point in the past by fires and handling and things like that. And they, in the 16th century, the people who owned the shroud at the time spent a great deal of money to get experts to use the, this French invisible reweaving method. And the idea is you would take uh, strands of fabric of, of um, linen and literally reweave new linen in where the old stuff was to basically reestablish the pattern. And it is called invisible because it is very difficult to detect with the eye, at least if you're not uh, expert yourself. Now, this is important because they need, uh, in order for this to explain the data, you have to explain how you get a 14th century, 13th century amount of radiocarbon for a first century object. And so the mm -hmm. idea is if you mix, uh, radiocarbon goes down when you die, you stop breathing, uh, yeah. citation needed, and you uh, you stop taking in new radiocarbon, so eventually it'll go down to zero. So something that died more recently will have more radiocarbon than something that died longer ago. And so if you have something that's first century, it would have less radiocarbon. Something that's 16th century would have more, average yeah. the two out, and you could get the 13th century they want, right? And in so, <clears throat> In principle, yes, you could... <laughs> it, it would work if you had the right proportions, which right. is one of the problems. Yeah. So, um, so, so there are uh, some problems. First of all, uh, the proportions you would need. If you do the math, it's not too difficult to do the math and, and average out what you would need. 80% of the tested area would have to be patch. That is mm. a very threadbare cloth. Like right. there's only 20% of original stuff in where they're reweaving. I mean, the thing's mm -hmm. basically gone at that point, but right. I, I'm not a textile expert. I can't say whether that's actually plausible. It just seems like a lot to me. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, the invisible reweave, uh, when it's said, when they say it's invisible, that's less of a description and more of a sales pitch. Uh, they're, right, they're, right. they're telling their customer, mm -hmm. hey, you won't be able to see it. And I'll be honest, when I, I have seen videos of people doing it and I've read some training manuals and stuff on how to do it, and it looks pretty darn good to me. Like if I gave my coat to a person who did this mending and they handed it back to me, I'd be perfectly satisfied, right? But I'm not a textile expert. Yeah. And so uh, with many mending um, processes, it's invisible from the front. And then yeah. they do all the nasty stuff on the back because nobody cares about the back, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, and so some experts in medieval textiles, such as uh, Mechthild Fleury Lemberg, she's a big name in the field. And she insists that it is not truly invisible to an expert when you can see both sides. Hmm. And so while I could look at it and I can't tell the difference, an expert looking at it with a trained eye can tell the difference according to her. Now, in all fairness, Joe Marino disagrees he has gone to people who do the the methodology mm -hmm. and so basically he has like three people who who currently use the method who mm -hmm. have looked at the shroud and say i don't think or this was repaired mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. um and you can't see it but it's it, it, it was repaired and then i found several textile experts um who were scholars who said no it had uh, you know <laughs> it mm -hmm, hasn't mm -hmm. been repaired right. because you can't see it and like you could see it if it had been now i'm not an expert i can't say which one is right but um it's at the very least not conclusive um, right right but lastly there's one piece of evidence that i think kind of nukes this this hypothesis mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. so for the dating you, you have a lot of constraints on how the mix of old to new would have to look like in order to get the dating we see when they did the radiocarbon dating there were no big changes in the mm -hmm. dates right? right so you couldn't have a seam of repair it couldn't be like they started the repairs halfway through the sample because then one side would be first century mm -hmm. the other side would not be right, right. so 
the repair, if there was one, would have had to have gone through the whole thing. It would have had to have been mostly consistent because there weren't big gaps between the labs. So they, you know, so the amount of damage between uh, all the sample sites would have had to have been about the same in all directions. However, they cannot be too consistent because there is a change between the different labs. Hmm. While inside the labs, the, it doesn't really matter how you arrange the samples, mm -hmm. um, according to Riani et al. Right. So that's not re relevant. Um, there, Each lab did have a different average date, even if they were similar, especially Oxford, right? Because Oxford right. states don't overlap with the other two. That would mean if the effect is solely from the reweaving, that there would have to be the Oxford area was... Uh, I forget which direction, more or less. It, it had a different amount of damage than the other two. And so when they were repairing, they repaired more or less in Oxford and elsewhere. And it just so happened to match up perfectly with where future researchers 400 years later cut the cloth. Could that be the case? I mean, sure, it could be the case. I don't think that's likely, though. Right, right. Yeah. So that seems to be falsified, to be honest. It's definitely a big mark against it. It doesn't fit with the reporting of Riani et al. Because uh, the, if it was from a repair, then mm -hmm. you would expect the the arrangement of the subsamples within each lab to matter. Because say, right. uh, if within Oxford, if they could have cut it up any different ways, right? And they could have cut it up in rows or columns or whatever. And if it was from a repair, how they cut it up would determine how much repaired cloth would mm -hmm, be in each mm -hmm. subsample. So right. you would expect the arrangement to matter. One of the results, which I think has been almost ignored by every, I have not heard a single person, not one person other than me, talk about that part of Riani. And I was so like <laughs> self-doubting. I was like, this cannot be this important if literally no one else has mentioned it. And I, so I like reached out to Riani. It's like, hey, am I actually reading this right? He's like, yeah, that's what it says. <laughs> so, right, right. So yeah, I, I so yeah, the invisible relief. It's not crazy because mm -hmm. it is a real it is a real right. weaving method. It is phenomenally good. Like if it's done well, mm. it, it it is pretty darn invisible to me. Uh, mm. But when you dig down into the details, I don't think it matches. Yeah, yeah. The invisibility of it. I mean, it's as you said. Uh, you would be pretty satisfied with a coat which is mended in sure. that way. Uh, part of that reason, I think, is because nobody's looking to the inside <laughs> part of our right. garments, right? And that's that's another thing. It's not like they just uh, looked at the shroud, said, oh, that's good, cut it up and threw it up. Like, they had textile experts who were looking at it at the time, and the samples have been examined front and back very close with with not just the human eye, but with, like, magnification and still mm. nobody's seen it right like, right i mean this is not just invisible reweaving like yeah. this is this would be incredible for it to <laughs> right, right. avoid a detection some people have suggested i mean th that's that theory seems to me to be verging on like um complete madness that well this, it was i mean uh, let me f uh, only finish the thought it's not uh, the invisible mending itself but rather uh, recall the huge patches that are next to jesus's mm -hmm. like shoulder and so on they're very crudely made it's uh, suggested that clarice nuns made that uh, uh, like uh, modification in the 15th century or something mm. and sometimes it's suggested that the same people <laughs> mended it invisibly in the very verge of the shroud. Now, that seems to me to be uh, like yeah. completely unbelievable and something we can reject outright. Why would we have used this amazing reweaving thing on a very tiny, insignificant portion all the way at the corner, and then next to Jesus' face, we just slap on yeah. whatever we have to hand. Now, uh, Joe's explanation for that is that the ownership changed right. um, over time. And so the owner at the time the repair in the corner was made was wealthier and had mm -hmm, more money mm -hmm. and resources, whereas the later repairs had to be done more cheaply. That is his right, explanation. Right. Is that, that makes sense. Tr okay. Mm -hmm. it, it, it could be true, yeah. but it is, it's an ad hoc hypothesis for which he has no additional information. Yeah, evidence. Yeah. There's no evidence that this person, there is evidence the person was wealthy and later owners weren't. Yeah. But there is no evidence that this person had access to these amazing weavers. He, it's just a hypothesis that he did have access, or they did, sorry, have access to these. Re I don't know if they did. Joe mm -hmm, doesn't mm -hmm. either. Uh, but it's just something else we have to accept. But, um, yeah. But even so, yeah. if we accept the like the steel man, the invisible mending hypothesis, and present it in its in this Joe Marino form, 
uh, even then, it seems to me that the arguments you've presented, uh, which uh, rely on the radiocarbon dating, are enough to just uh, assess it as less likely uh, than uh, the, the theory or the hypothesis which just says, listen, this is a 13th century cloth, and that's it. Yeah, I think there are better explanations that fit the data without as much stretching. Let's go now for the contamination hypothesis. The argumentation goes like this. Uh, well, I mean, it, it, that's one form of it, because uh, pro, the pro-authenticity people have many different solutions. But I've heard it suggested that uh, clergy in the Middle Ages had, like, disgustingly uh, uh, dirty fingers, and yet the relic had to be, like, displayed to the people. So what they would do is to grab exactly that part of the shroud, right? Um, and when they display it, yeah? Mm, and... This would, each time th that was done, uh, the cloth would get dirtier and dirtier and dirtier, and somehow the bacteria or the, the dirt or whatever it is, mm, the contamination in any case, would get like mm, mm, inside of the cloth. And that's supposed to be uh, the, the justification why it was dated uh, to the 12th century. The reasoning is, is similar as with the weave, right? So there's material or organic material. Uh, uh, from a living being, in this case, a human. Some humans sweat, or some humans, like, uh, parts of their skin, uh, and so on. And that's supposed to be in the shroud, and when it's dated, then uh, it goes all wrong. The carbon uh, from the fingers of the clergy, or whatever it is, mm, are dated uh, along with the first century linen, and we get a false result. Uh, what do you think about this line of reasoning? So there's, uh, I'm going to talk about two different contamination hypotheses, mm -hmm. one which is my preferred explanation, the one that you just talked about. So mm -hmm. if you're looking at contamination to explain going from first century to 13th, mm -hmm. uh, it, it is true, like you said, when you touch it, you'd add your oils, or if they, you know, breathe on or whatever, you'd add biological particles to it, which had modern, modern at the time carbons, so you'd be adding new carbon to it, right? So that would potentially shift the age. This is a known thing, which is why labs don't just take a sample and chuck it in the machine. They do a lot of work to try to clean contamination to right. ensure that their sample is pristine. Uh, but <clears throat> before we worry about like whether or not it could happen, we should know how much we're talking, right? Uh, how much contamination would we need? And uh, the amount you need to varies depending on whether the amount is modern carbon, because that would have the most carbon-14 you'd be adding, or if it was medieval. Mm. Uh, but suppose that we uh, key into the 16th century, because that's when the, like, the fires happen and stuff. That's when right. all these repairs happen. Let's just use that date. Suppose that all the contamination that's supposed to drag this thing from 1st century to the 14th or 13th uh, is from the 16th century. Mm. You would need... 80% of the measured carbon from the linen to be contamination. 80%. That means only 20% of it can come from the cellulose itself, right? Right, right. And and th this is, rem as a reminder, this is after cleaning. So in fact, the mm -hmm, real number would mm -hmm, have to be yeah. even higher than that because presumably they got at least some of it from cleaning, right, right? Right. But even if you assume they're completely incompetent, they didn't clean it at all. They just you know lied mm. to everyone and then immediately tested it. You'd need eighty percent of the contamin of the carbon to be contamination. That thing would be black. It would be yeah. you'd be able to see it with your eyes that it was right. contaminated. Like this clearly, it, it, there's no way that this would have passed <laughs> scrutiny. It's just it's just completely implausible that right, right. everyone. Every step of the way, the, the textile efforts, experts who are looking at it, the person who was doing the cutting, the labs who received it, the every step of the way, mm -hmm. everyone would have had just basically closed their eyes, and not <laughs> it's just it's just absurd. Uh, right, right, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, it, th that's just that just does not hold water at all. Now, right. So, trying to explain first century to thirteenth, that doesn't work. But mm. we don't need to go. That the goal it should not be how can we explain first century to thirteenth right the goal should be we have this data what is the best explanation for the data that is as simple as possible requires the fewest ad hoc assumptions explains everything right yeah. that's the goal right right and so if you look if you look at contamination from that aspect well Oxford's is just a little bit to the to the right like we said before mm -hmm. it's a little bit older than the other ones right and the effect of contamination if they cleaned better if Oxford cleaned a little bit better their sample would be a little bit older because they would have less modern carbon in it mucking things right. up yeah 
And so if you look at the methodology, which was published in Nature in the original article, you can look at the methods between the three labs, and they're they're similar. Their contamination cleaning was similar, but at the time, radiocarbon labs were not as standardized as they are now. Actually, some years after the shroud, they had a big conference and got together and like compared their methods and like because this was a known mm-hmm. problem that different right. cleaning methods would lead to different dates because they weren't the same. And so Oxford specifically used petroleum ether to mm-hmm. clean their mm-hmm. samples in addition to other things. Neither of the other two labs did. Right. Petroleum ether is a, a substance that is specifically good at removing things like candle wax, grease, oil, stuff that we know was around the shroud, right? Yeah. And it mm-hmm. so this is better at that. And the 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 ways the other two labs did is not as good. Yeah. And so we know that Oxford used this this method. We know this method is good at better removing stuff than the other two methods were. And so if we hypothesize that this is the reason. Oxford would only need to have removed 1.2% more contamination than the other two apps. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's it. So (laughs) that's totally feasible, right? This is not a a big stretch. This is using only things we know for sure happened. It's only uh, it's using mechanisms that are extremely well established and well understood. It's using only it doesn't require miracles or magic or conspiracies or anything. All that's required is one lab was a little bit better than the other two, and that's it. Right. Now, I don't know for sure that this is what happened, uh, because I don't know for sure what kind of contaminants were on the cloth. Hmm. We could test that other Arizona sample that exists and see. You know, yeah. that would be a way to verify this. Um, so I can't say for certain, like, this is definitely the, the case. But if I'm comparing hypotheses, which one explains all the data? Well, this one explains all the data. Why is Oxford off? Because they cleaned it better. Why does the arrangement of the samples not matter? Because all of the samples within a lab were treated the same way. Hmm. It, it explains all of the data, leaves nothing out, and requires no ad hoc assumptions. And it's actually testable because uh, the Arizona bit could be just cleaned with petroleum ether, and we can just give it a try. Sure. We, we could we could test it tomorrow if if they were so inclined. Of course, they'd have to destroy their sample to test it, and I'm sure they're not keen to do that, but, you know, we could. Right. On the other hand, I'm, I'm not sure what's the point of keeping that little part of the shroud in, in Arizona, if not for if not test purposes yeah. like this, right? <laughs> I, I believe, uh, I'm quoting off memory, so I could be wrong. I think that it's Joel, J-U-L-L. I think that's the individual mm-hmm. who has it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm sure people in the comments will let me know if I'm incorrect. I believe that's who has it. So if you want this to be done, go <laughs> on the internet and find this guy's contact info and bug him about it, I guess. <laughs> Don't actually do that. Don't bother this poor man. Right. But <laughs> so summarizing the contamination hypothesis or the idea that some contamination like, took place, uh, we can say that there are fringe theories about it. And if you want to rescue the first century dating or the idea that it is from the first century, don't go for the contamination hypothesis because that's what, that one is dead. But if we want to explain the difference between the, the results in the three labs that uh, you know uh, uh, conducted the radiocarbon dating, that, yeah, the hypothesis, hypothesis of contamination could be the explanation. It could be it. Sure. Yeah. So now I want to go to the uh, what seems to me to be the craziest uh, uh, hypothesis. I mean, it has some plausibilities uh, uh, in a strange way, but it uh, s- certainly strikes me as the least parsimonious of the bunch. And that is uh, Bob Rucker's, uh, what was it, uh, radiation theory, but uh, neutrino absorption theory, was it? Neutron. Neutron, Neutron. absorption Neutron. hypothesis, yes. Right, right. Yeah, so this one... <laughs> This one is, uh, it's an idea. So Bob Rucker, like I said, is a nuclear engineer like me. And so his hypothesis is that uh, the radiocarbon that was measured is actually there. They, they, mm-hmm. ac- they correctly and accurately measured what, what, what was in the samples they got. The problem is that extra carbon-14 had been added after the first century or after it, the cloth had been woven. To understand this, you have to know a little bit about how carbon-14 is made. In the atmosphere, cosmic rays sometimes knock neutrons off of um, atoms. Those neutrons go flying around, and sometimes they'll be absorbed by nitrogen. Um, When nitrogen absorbs a neutron, it becomes carbon-14. And so if it is just a matter of physics, if you throw a whole bunch of neutrons at nitrogen, you will get carbon-14. 
And so his hypothesis is that is exactly what happened. There is trace amounts of nitrogen in uh, linen. Uh, and so he says that there was a huge burst of neutrons that blasted through this cloth and uh, that that led to the production of carbon-14. And so it was sufficient to take this first century cloth, add car radiocarbon to make it look medieval. As a consequence of this, he also hypothesized that were you to test the center, like where the chest is, um, because his idea is that the body disintegrated. This is not technically part of his hypothesis, but he says he thinks that Jesus engaged in interdimensional travel and mm -hmm. that he his body his body disintegrated and some fraction of his neutrons and protons burst through the cloth. That's why the image is there. Um, so basically uniformly. So where there's more body, there'd be more neutrons is the idea. Yeah. And so were you to test where the chest is, where the most mass is, that would date into the future. You would get mm -hmm, a date mm -hmm. of like eight, I think it's like 8,000 CE. Um, and so obviously that would be physically impossible by hmm. normal mechanisms. So that would be a huge right. confirmation, right? And so that that's his idea. And uh, one of the selling points is that it also, he says, explains the image uh, because hmm. the protons, he says, would have discolored the cloth. It would have uh, dehydrated the fibers and that would have caused them to become brown. Um, that's the idea. Yeah. And it's in synchrony with... What's typically said, I mean, maybe not typically, but a lot of pro-authenticity people like the idea of the radiation burst anyway. They like it because they use it as an explanation of image formation, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah. uh, not really the, the, uh, the dating. But here, mm, uh, uh, the, the idea of the radiation burst serves both purposes. Right. And so being as charitable as I can, if you have a hypothesis that explains multiple things about your object, that's preferable, right? Uh, a lot of times in science, when uh, a way you know you're on the right track is mm -hmm. if you propose an explanation for one thing that happens to explain some other thing too. Like with evolution, for example. Right. Uh, so, you know, th that, so I can see <laughs> why they, they would see this as a good thing, but there's just so many things you just have to accept. Right, uh, in right. order to for this hypothesis to work. First, one of them, if we're talking about the image, when radiation occurs in nature, it almost always goes in all directions equally. Um, and so that cannot be the case here, though, because the image is, I mean, it's kind of fuzzy, but it, it's not like distorted. Like if, if you ever seen right. uh, in like video game files, the mat, the, the like the texture oh, yes. uh, of the character, it's like all splayed out and like right. weird mm -hmm. because it's all angles, right? It's well, called UV the, unwrapping. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, well, if the cloth, the cloth would have been draped on the face, right? Because yeah. it's just there. Um, had the radiation gone in all directions like radiation does, it would look like, like those that. files. Yeah, yeah. It would, <laughs> the the you know, ears Jesus would be like all... here. Right. <laughs> exactly, right, right. But it doesn't. It's it's just a clear one-to-one. -one. Uh, to explain that, they require that the protons, at least, went only in one direction, just up and down. Why did they do that? I don't know. Just because. Because that's the answer we need. Because I said so. That, Right. Now, there's things that can make that happen. Uh, a magnetic field, perhaps. Uh, well, that would also be problematic. But you know what? It, it doesn't matter. Like It's just like, that's just another thing you'd have to accept. There's no mechanism. Uh, another problem is there's way more neutrons and protons. And if, if you were to just turn all of the Jesus body and energy, it would blow up the tomb. So you need just mm. like some small, very tiny fraction of the neutrons and protons to... Um, be irradiated why that fraction and no other well because that's the answer they need there's no further reason it's just that's the answer they need uh why would the amount of neutrons be roughly equal to the number of protons no reason just because that's the answer we want it's just <laughs> it, it, it's from start to finish it's just magic and right. i know uh they get very irritated when i say oh it's a miracle I i'm not hypothesizing a miracle you're right. You're hypothesizing interdimensional travel. Mm. Come on, man. It's a it's magic. Like I don't. <laughs> and a guy who who just like, uh, how many people do we know of who suddenly have those bursts of radiation <laughs> right. and collimated ones? It's a collimated yeah. radiation burst. Like, exactly. We know no examples of such a thing. 
this that this sounds would like be, a miracle, doesn't it? Yeah, this would be unique in history. It would be at least the the term that that uh, they usually prefer is exotic physics. Well, if you're pulling out exotic physics, that's just magic. Like to explain <laughs> this this one off thing. Um, right. All of that said, while it is a magical explanation, regardless of what they say, this is magic. Uh, it's ad hoc at every level. Um, mm -hmm. There, there is no evidence to support this um, mm -hmm. because uh, you might see in Bob Recker's work, he's got this cool graph because he used MCNP, which is a software used to simulate neutrons. Don't be bewildered by the fact that he used a computer program. It, it is a very good computer program for tracking how neutrons, but all it does is it just tracks neutrons through space to tell you where they would go. That's all it is. The, the curve that you got I mean, it's cool that he used MCMP, I guess, but like mm. that if you just told me, hey, this body's gonna disintegrate evenly, what would it look like? That's the curve you'd get. So like you didn't need MCMP to tell you that, but whatever. Um <clears throat> it's there's no there's no magic in MCMP. You have to tell it <clears throat> what MCMP will give you is a distribution, but it doesn't know how many neutrons are in each spot. You have to tell it, hey, at this one spot, this is what your neutron flux is. And so he told it, hey, at this spot where they did the dating, this is the neutron flux. He put in the data we have. Mm, so it's hand. not a confirmation. Right. It's not a confirmation. Now, uh, <clears throat> the driving force behind this, according to Bob, is that it explains the slope of the dates. Mm. And yeah, this is the yeah. big thing they'll say. Uh, so if you look at the data, uh, remember we talked about how Arizona's at the top, then Zurich, uh, than Oxford. And if you were to plot the, the means of their dates, it would make a slope. And that would mean it would be getting younger as you got closer to the middle, mm. right? So his explanation is, well, it's getting younger because it's getting more neutrons as you get closer to the body right. or the middle of the body, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he says his model, you know, matches that well. It doesn't, I mean, it's like, his model's like one and a half times off, but I guess I don't know if that's close. It's a, <laughs> it's subjective. Uh, I'm not. That's not particularly close to me, but okay. Mm. Uh, but in any case, you've got three data points. It's not hard to get a slope out of three, right, right? right? Like, and it's not like you've got one, two, three. You've got one, two, three. Mm -hmm, that's mm -hmm. also so. Really, you've got two data points you're making right, a slope right. out of, right? And but once again, this doesn't match all of the data. It matches the means. But remember that Riani et al. Um, paper I talked about. Yes. If this was from neutron irradiation, you would expect the arrangement of samples uh, within each lab to be very important because if they were further up on the cloth, they should be getting more neutrons. So it would change yeah. the date. So it should matter a lot how they're arranged. It does not, in fact, matter at all how they're arranged. <laughs> what matters is which lab did the dating. Well, that doesn't mm -hmm. sound like neutrons to me, right? Right, right. In defense of this hypothesis, the the one thing I can say about it is it is testable. Yeah. And it is it is rare that you get a miracle claim with a well-known, well-understood, well-vetted test that you could do tomorrow. Like, yeah. that is not common, and this would be super easy to test. All you would need to do, you'd either, I guess you could do another round of radiocarbon dating. That would be the best thing. But I've done some quick math uh, <clears throat> because there'd be just so much carbon-14 at the chest area, I think you could test it with like a Geiger counter, mm -hmm. uh, which is a device you use to detect radiation. You wouldn't get very precise measurements, but I think you could say there's a lot more here than there. Mm -hmm. And that's non-destructive. You just need to like right. wave it over the top. Um, and you can buy your Geiger <laughs> counter on Amazon. So it's uh, I, the difficulty I, isn't there when it comes to one, the, oh, here right we go. Here, actually, yeah. <laughs> I, have, I have a Geiger counter right here. Uh, this will... This is my own personal Geiger counter I got okay, for fun. Okay, so I think it's deci <laughs> we've decided to go to Turin now. We, we, we're equipped yeah. to do it. If anyone can convince the Pope to let us run this test, I will <laughs> buy my own ticket and bring my own Geiger counter. Just let me wave this over the cloth real quick and we can settle this whole thing. Right. And so it is testable. I guess it's got that going for it. But here's the thing. Until it's tested, it's just an idea with no evidence for it whatsoever. Um, right. And so, like, people constantly pull this out as if this is the explanation. You know, because it, but it's just, like, it's just an assertion. It has no evidence. Yeah. Uh, I guess you're going to get people in the comments talking about the Sidari Movoviedo if I don't mention it. Yeah, because yeah. And by the way, he mentions that as one of the data points. I mean, yes. 
I, I must say, it strikes me as crazy. I mean, in, if you watch some Shroud of Turin documentaries, sometimes they uh, use the following argumentation. You see the radiocarbon dating dated the Shroud to the 13th century, but the, the Sudarium of Oviedo was on the same body, and that was dated to the 6th century. As if that uh, helps in thing. anything, because <laughs> the 6th century is still not the 1st century, right? But yeah. uh, I guess this could be worked into the the theory or the hypothesis that Bob Rucker is presenting because like if we place it somewhere right maybe around the, the head uh, there's he, he he says that it's going to be like dating to the future where the center of of mass is or something like that so I guess you could say that maybe if we place it around the head it go it's going to date to the sixth century so I, I guess it, there's some like some consistency well, in that picture. Maybe you tell me. Actually, <laughs> it's it, it's potentially internally consistent because mm -hmm. um, so his model he has the Sudarium of Oviedo, which is allegedly the face cloth of Jesus. They would have put it on his face as they were carting the body to the tomb and then thrown the face cloth off and wrapped it. And so the the cloth allegedly was somewhere in this tomb. Right. And so it would have gotten some level of neutron irradiation. So it would have had some level of carbon 14 production. Mm. And in his idea, he said, Oh, I tested it by the head, which is where I thought it would be. And oh, look, it just happens to be seven, uh, 700. It matches the dating. Hooray. It's a confirmation. But here's the thing. First of all, I don't know if I believe that. But let's say that he had done the test. He had done the test with the cloth where it was, and it had tested. Four, 400 or 1200 or mm -hmm. whatever. Does anyone believe he would have said, oh, well, I'm wrong. I'm just going to throw my idea. No, <laughs> because nobody knows where the cloth was. And if you move it in the tomb, mm -hmm. it can have any date you want. It can have any date from the first century, if you put it sufficiently far mm -hmm. away from the body, to 8000 CE, if you slapped it on the chest and anything in between. It's completely arbitrary. Right, right. You could have any you can get any result you want by moving this around in space and again yeah. we don't know where it was and so this isn't confirmation this is just another assertion <laughs> yeah i mean now it's i feel like we can just gerrymander a hypothesis to to fit any data we want like that's the the beauty of postulating magic right i mean right. that's the beauty of postulating an omnipotent god he can do anything right, right. if he wanted it to date to like the 20th century ce like he could do that what's the problem with doing that i mean he right. is almighty right yeah and sure so now we're i don't feel like we are doing science anymore <laughs> and but, but then again i want to be be clear uh give the devil or god his due i guess that if the shroud were tested and like if we take a, a segment from his chest or something from the man's chest right mm -hmm. from the shroud of turin and date it and it really dates to the future now that would be something uh, I, I oh, would yeah. look at that and say, wow, uh, Bob, you got that right. Uh, so I mean, congratulations. <laughs> I got to be honest. I I have thought about it. I cannot imagine any non-magical explanation for why there would be a, a cloth that would date millennia into the future. Right. Like to have that level of carbon-14, I Maybe someone smarter than me can figure out one. I can't. And so yeah. if they if if they did the test and it was vetted, I'd wanted the test to be done multiple times just mm -hmm, to be sure. Mm -hmm. But like And by different test. labs and so on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But if we did the test, we did it right, and it's like sure enough, it's eight thousand CE. I'm convinced at that point. Yeah. Like, you know, fair enough. I guess I was wrong. But yeah. like you need to actually do that step <laughs> before. That's right, that's right. Yeah. And I'm so uh, at the beginning of our conversation, we uh, talked about the Arizona bits. Because there are there were two bits of, mm -hmm. of the linen, and I'm thinking. I mean, that crossed my mind at the time that maybe if we date, uh, I mean, so the, the the lower part wasn't tested. Uh, if we did the test, it might also uh, serve as some disconfirming uh, evidence uh, um, against the the thesis of Bob Rucker. I I think. So let me. It it mm -hmm. could it would depend on what the results were but here's one thing to keep in mind is we've gotten much much better at radiocarbon dating now than we were uh what would have been 
about 90. So what is that? 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. Uh, We've gotten much better at cleaning samples, preparing them at dating them at everything. Right. And so if suppose Oxford's data, which is a little bit older is the more correct amount. Mm -hmm. Right. And we do think that. And, and I think that, uh, if we were to repeat the test and Arizona's second sample is right next to Oxford, what I would expect you'd find is a date that's pretty close to Oxford's because I mm-hmm, think mm-hmm. Be- not because it's down at the bottom, but because it's correct. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. And, and in that case, he, he, he would say that. Oh, yeah, look, it's actually, a confirmation. It's mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. he would just add that data point to his <laughs> slope, ignoring the fact that these two data points were done 30 years ago with different procedures and everything else. Yeah. So I don't think that would actually clear this up yeah. because yeah, that makes you, sense. you, you'd have an alternative explanation. Now, yeah. I'd like to grill Bob Rucker a little bit more. During your debate with, like, Joe, Mar- or discussion, I guess, with Joe Marino and Bob and a bunch of other uh, syndenologists, you stressed that one of the components of our theory making, right, uh, the, the theoretical virtues a hypothesis is supposed to have, if, it, if we, for example, take the... Uh, Mm, you know, reasoning to the best uh, explanation, inference to the best explanation approach, then one of the mm, mm, criteria we should care about is parsimony, simplicity of explanation. Uh, And uh, once you said that to Bob, he said that this is a third level consideration. It it, it really isn't all that important, right? (laughs) Now, that seems extremely suspicious to me uh, because that's, as, as far as I think, Uh, that's exactly the criteria that kills his theory, that exposes the theory as the worst of the bunch, Like in my opinion. Mm -hmm. It's much worse. I mean, it's much less... The prior probability... If we think about it in uh, in terms of Bayesian epistemology, right, Uh, of Bayes' theorem, then the prior probability of that theory is just minuscule. It's like infinitesimal. uh, Because it's basically... uh, uh, If we consider the evidence then yeah, we would expect that data. Of course, we would expect that data. You've just postulated a theory which just says, right. I would expect that, right? And you've, you, he sort of has written that in by hand. But then the prior probability, if we consider that, if we consider the simplicity of the explanation, then like, I don't believe in God. I don't believe God raised Jesus. Do I need to believe that in order to even consider uh, that hypothesis? How many people were, were resurrected? How many people like have these bursts of radiation? Uh, how many cloths did we uh, notice in reality which date to the future or parts of them which date to the future? I think that... Uh, this theory is hopeless as far as parsimony is concerned. I want to have your take on that. Yeah. So as a thought experiment, just to to, to illustrate the virtues of simplicity, uh, imagine that your neighbors are gone. They've been gone for days. Uh, You try to call them and you get no answer. And you recall, like a week ago, they mentioned something about the mountains, like maybe going to the mountains. One hypothesis, they went to the mountains. They're on vacation. They can't have self-perception. Hypothesis two, they were abducted by a drug cartel and they are now being held hostage in an unknown location by a Mm -hmm. guy named Estevez. Both of those things explain the data perfectly well. Yeah, of course. One of them is a lot simpler. (laughs) Yeah, and we can escalate that even. We can postulate that it was aliens who abducted them. Or uh, it was aliens who abducted them, but then in turn those aliens were abducted by a whole other bunch of aliens and so on. We can just increase the complexity of the explanation. And uh, obviously, like, that happens with some frequency, right? People going to the mountains, that happens with quite some frequency. It's it's an ordinary event. We should expect that to happen every now and again. The prior probability of that happening is fairly high. But the abduction by a drug cartel, uh, that happens almost never. Yeah, right. As far as the whole population of the entire right. Earth is concerned, right? The seven right. billion people on Earth. Uh, so uh, naturally, we should prefer the the uh, option of the, the the hiking, right? The the intentional trip to the mountains. Right. Exactly. And that's what's going on here. Like we, it is not that it's they'll often accuse this kind of I, this kind of um, thought process as like a bias. Like, oh, you just have an anti-supernatural bias. And that's not the case. It's not a bias. It's even if you're right, even if the supernatural exists and miracles occur, they are still rare, 
Miracles right, don't happen all the time, even if they happen. Almost yeah. by definition, they don't happen very often. Right. So even if you accept that miracles can happen, their prior probability should be low. But I have no reason to accept them, yet you want to convince me of them. Right. So my exactly. prior probability is naturally going to be even lower. And that's not a bias. It's just the evidence I have to date. And I, I'm <laughs> I don't know exactly how else right. to explain it. Like, uh, I'm sorry that your explanation is if your explanation, the more things, the more features you add to an explanation yeah. without supporting evidence necessarily reduces the probability of your hypothesis. That's, right. that's just the way the math works out, because you have a bubble of probability space. All the probability of all the explanations is here right? The probability of hypothesis A is some subset of hypothesis A plus some other postulate B is, a, is small, has to be smaller, has to yeah. be, right? And so that's all this neutron irradiation hypothesis is that all over. It's just a postulate after postulate after postulate after postulate with no supporting evidence. Yeah, all of this could be over, confer, uh, overcome by evidence. So it's not like we're out ruling yes. things out at the beginning. We're just but we should be looking for What's the explanation that requires us to make the least ad hoc assumptions, the least assumptions, the least additional postulates, right? What's the thing that explains all the evidence? What's the thing that requires us to give up fewer well-evidenced beliefs? Yeah. Uh, so, for example, Bob Rucker's hypothesis would require that physics, if he wants to insist it's not magic, which it is, but if he wants to insist it's not, then that means that physics is completely wrong. Everything mm. we have thought we understood about physics, we should just chuck out the window, at least past Newtonian physics. So right. that means general relativity, quantum mechanics, no good here. Well, if you want me to give up general relativity to believe in your hypothesis, you have better have some darn good evidence. You know, yeah. like, because yeah. we have a lot of very good reasons to expect that general relativity is mostly correct. And so if your hypothesis says, nope, general relativity is out, <laughs> yeah. So yeah. yeah, simplicity. It is true that it is not the only concern. It yeah. is perhaps not the chief concern. But to say that it's just like, oh, it, it's a third level concern. You don't need to look at. Yeah, we, yeah, you don't want us to look at it because your hypothesis sucks on that. You know? <laughs> exactly right. Exactly <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. I hope. I, I mean, I'm glad we got that out. Mm, the internet needs to get a taste of of that point of view when it comes to assessing uh, Bob Rucker's theory. And here's the thing. Uh, you talk about epistemology, Bayesian, and I'm a good Bayesian, you know, so I'm all about it. But Pete, this isn't like some esoteric thing that we're just making mm -hmm. up. This is how people live their lives. This is how of everyone course. assesses information all the time. If you are looking for explanations for a thing in your house, you immediately go to the simplest explanation because it's usually right. Yeah. It's not always right. Sometimes weird things happen. Okay, yeah. sometimes, but usually not. That's why they're weird. <laughs> so. and yeah, and extraordinary claims uh, require extraordinary evidence. That's right. why we're uh, not surprised when a friend or an acquaintance tells us that they have a dog at their house, and we are surprised when, when they tell us that they have a nuclear bomb uh, at their house, because that just happens much... Uh, the, the frequency of that event... The, the relative frequencies cannot be fairly compared, right? The right. nuclear bomb at my house happens maybe never and possibly uh, extremely rarely, right? They have to be stored somewhere, but pro presumably it's... Not your uh, house. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, so uh, as a concluding thought, I wanted to get back um, to the consideration that this radiocarbon dating really is the most important piece of evidence because... Uh, like Giulio Fanti and his team back in Italy, they can come up with their like, uh, uh, like uh, new methods, uh, like groundbreaking methods, which have only been tested on like uh, three cloths that they have from Egypt and the Shroud of Turin. Mm. But it seems to me that this, the evidence that they present then is just much weaker. We should uh, give that maybe even in the light of him not being exactly unbiased, but let's ignore that. So it, it just strikes me that the quality of evidence which comes from the radiocarbon dating is just much better than the speculations about, listen, uh, the guy on the shroud looks much like uh, Jesus the Pantocrator from, from the image, or maybe that, listen... Uh, 
it's that there's real blood on the shroud as if that was supposed to change anything uh, it really seems to me that this is the key piece of evidence and it hasn't been rejected successfully by the crit criticisms that we hear from the syndenologists uh, do you share that view and and if not uh, just tell me why <laughs> yeah i think it's the single most important piece of evidence when it comes to the shroud's authenticity because ultimately uh, dale's argument aside if it's not first century it is not Jesus Shroud. Whatever else it is, it is not Jesus Shroud. And that mm -hmm. is the question that everyone wants to know. If all you want to know is whether it's first century or not, then the radiocarbon dating is perfectly adequate to tell you that because they detected yeah. medieval carbon. And I also think it's kind of, um, it's convenient that the Shroud shows up in history uh, in the 13th century in France, right? And it just so happens that the radiocarbon <laughs> dating puts it right then. Isn't yeah, that yeah. weird? Yeah, crazy how that just works out, right? <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, I think it's the single most important piece of evidence. It's not the only piece of evidence, but I think that the burden is on, uh, if someone wants us to reject this wet, very well-established, extremely well-vetted, well-understood methodology, the burden is on them to show us why we should. Um, and I don't think that burden has been met by anyone. I think that every piece of evidence I have seen for why the shroud actually is first century. Oh, there's this icon in Turkey, or there's uh, the prey codex uh, is the same, identical to Jesus, except don't worry about the beard. He doesn't have a beard, but don't worry, <laughs> that, don't worry about that, obviously, right? You know, the, the, look at the holes. Uh, so all of these things have other alternative explanations that I think are just as valid. Um, and so what's the simplest explanation? The carbon-14 dated to the Middle Ages? Because it's medieval. Yeah. And on that point, uh, I wanted to end the interview. I, thank you so much uh, for, for participating in this. In my opinion, the greatest gift we can give to, the, to our opponent when we discuss uh, mm, things like this uh, with them is to treat their arguments seriously. And I think this is what you're doing. Uh, I've seen all of your Shroud videos, the whole playlist. I binged on that. I'm thrilled that I found it. And I really feel like mm, you treat them seriously. We, you consider each of those those uh, critiques, each of those pieces of evidence on their own terms and try to formulate an honest opinion. Uh, I thank you for that and, and thank you for, for, uh, for joining me today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks. Goodbye.